In this video, I'm going to be explaining and showing you every single graphics option for the DuckStation emulator. So by the end of the video, you'll know what you're setting, why you're setting it, and if you want to be setting it in the first place. Along with knowing, you know, what these actually look like. Now every time I make a full graphics guide for DuckStation, Stensic the dev, usually within a couple of weeks, will update it, add a bunch of new features and move some stuff around. Which is why we're coming back to this one, in an effort to keep this guide in line with the latest releases of DuckStation. So even if you've seen the previous videos, you might still want to stick around to check out those new features. I'm also going to be showing you how to use shaders and save all of this on a per game basis, along with seeing all of your changes take place in real time. So let's just get straight into it. So we're going to start with the graphics tab right at the top with the graphics renderers slash APIs. Now if you're a purist and you intend to keep the original resolution and you want the best possible accuracy, software is definitely the best one to use. This is using your CPU for all instructions, including rendering graphics, which your GPU normally handles. As a result, you can't increase your internal resolution or use the majority of the enhancements with it, which may be a deal breaker for some. But if you're a purist, these are inconsequential to you. So if you like that, just go with software mode. But keep in mind it is much more performance costly because it's not using your GPU. If you do want to upscale and enhance, you'll need to use one of the four hardware renderers. Now OpenGL is the most accurate and compatible out of all of these. It's also the one that you're going to see the least amount of issues with, making it the most robust choice in general. One downside though is that it doesn't perform as well as Vulkan or Direct3D. Vulkan definitely performs the best, but it is the least compatible and it's the one that you're going to potentially see the most amount of issues with. But with Vulkan implementation getting better over time, it's still a solid choice, especially if you're on lower end hardware. Direct3D 11 and 12 are the middle ground. They perform better than OpenGL, but not as good as Vulkan. And when it comes to issues, again, these sit in the middle. Now, depending on your graphics hardware, you may be restricted on choice. But if you've got a newer GPU, you should have all of them to choose from. Sometimes the easiest fix for an issue is to simply change your graphics backend and don't be afraid to do so. Now we can move on to internal resolution. An increase in this will increase your pixel count, adding the required amount of pixels for whichever resolution you set. And doing this on its own does reduce the amount of jaggies on polygons and gives a sharper overall image. As a rule of thumb, it's generally recommended to set this to your screen resolution. And then if you further want to clean up the image, use anti-aliasing. But a common question I do get is, can I set this above my screen resolution? And the answer is, yes, you can. Now, the main reason you might want to do this is for anti-aliasing. When you set your internal resolution beyond your screen resolution, you're effectively applying super sample anti-aliasing, but without actually applying any anti-aliasing algorithms, which some people do prefer to do. But do keep in mind that you can introduce downscaling artifacts, which is why for the most part, you should be using your screen resolution. Downsampling is used by those that want to increase their internal resolution to get all the benefits from it, but then output at a lower resolution to keep things looking authentic, kind of like having your cake and eating it. So box downsampling will downsample the entire image. And when you select it, you can even select which resolution you downsample to on the right hand side, giving you quite a lot of granular control. Adaptive downsampling will only affect the 2D assets. It will leave all of the 3D stuff well alone and downsample the 2D stuff exclusively to the original resolution. In my opinion, 2D stuff at higher resolutions can look a little bit janky, and being able to downsample these to the original res independently is a godsend. Now DuckStation has a brand new feature, and that's being able to filter 3D textures and 2D textures separately, which like adaptive downsampling is pretty awesome. Now texture filtering is generally used to help smooth the appearance of 3D polygon textures and or 2D assets with the use of one of these filters. Nearest neighbor, which is the default, isn't actually applying any filtering. So it looks the sharpest, but it also looks the most pixelated. So if you don't like that pixelated look, you can select one of these to help smooth it out. Texture filtering is for the 3D stuff only, and sprite texture filtering is for the 2D stuff only. And which filter you choose for each definitely comes down to personal preference, as they all look slightly different. For myself, I leave both of these on nearest, as I use adaptive downsampling to smooth the 2D assets under the more accurate nearest neighbor filtering. And for the 3D stuff, I actually prefer nearest neighbor. But of course, the whole point is you can do whatever you want to both the 3D assets and 2D assets independently. So there are three different ways to display a 4x3 image. 
Auto Game Native, which actually displays a slightly narrower image to 4x3. And according to the tooltip, it's been set that way, as it's probably how it was output to a CRT. However, for me, it does look too narrow. Setting proper 4x3 is slightly wider, as it's actually displaying into 4x3, and is what I generally use by default. And at the bottom, we've got PAR 1 to 1, which displays perfectly square 1 to 1 pixels. This is kind of like using pixel perfect mode. Which of these is technically correct is mostly down to opinion. Due to the nature of analog hardware and its wiggle room, the aspect ratio could have looked quite different on different TVs. For me, it's more about which one of these 4x3 options looks proportionally correct for the game, which in my opinion is mostly 4x3, or even par 1 to 1 for some games. Now with widescreen, you can just stretch a 4x3 image, but this really, really isn't the one. Instead, we can get games to display into proper anamorphic widescreen, with no stretching or distortion. There are three different ways to do this, all of which need 16x9 to be set. Firstly, a bunch of games have native widescreen support. I'll put a list of these in the description below. Just make sure to select the widescreen option in the actual in-game settings. Secondly, we can hack 16x9 with widescreen cheats. These do work really well for most games that actually have a cheat available. Just make sure to have cheats active in the console options to get access to them. Most of the cheats you want are already added to the emulator. And thirdly, we've got the internal widescreen hack, which is this widescreen rendering option here. This is doing the same thing that cheats are doing, but in more of a one size fits all manner. Widescreen cheats have been made for that game specifically, and as a result, generally get better results. So if you are hacking widescreen, check to see if your game has a cheat first, and if it doesn't or it's not working for any reason, then use the widescreen rendering option as an alternative. But definitely keep it off by default and only turn it on for the games that absolutely need it. When you're using widescreen, FMV sequences will be stretched from 4x3 into 16x9. And to stop that from happening, simply activate Force 4x3 for FMVs. Now there's a bunch of PS1 games that have a native resolution of 480i, way more than what I thought, and I'll put a list of these games in the description below. But that I unfortunately does mean interlaced, which looks absolutely horrific on modern digital displays, as interlacing was really intended for CRTs. But thankfully, we've got two different methods to get rid of that interlacing. We've got this deinterlacing option here and this disable interlacing option at the bottom. Between the two, disable interlacing works much, much better. But unfortunately, it's not compatible with every interlaced game. So when you turn this off, this deinterlacing option will automatically step in. And you can choose from one of these four algorithms to help merge those interlacing lines. This isn't a preference thing, it's just which one is actually working best. The likelihood that you'll actually need to use this deinterlacing option is very slim. So you want to leave this disable interlacing option on by default, and if it doesn't work with a game, simply turn it off and then flick your way through one of these to find the best one. Nice and easy. Now we can move on to the crop function. So back in the day on CRT TVs, the edge of the image would be covered up by the bezel on your TV. This was known as the overscan area, and a lot of game devs wouldn't actually apply any functional pixels, none that you're meant to see at least, in that overscan area. And for those games, setting the crop to only overscan area is the best way to maximize your screen real estate. However, there are some games that have functional pixels all the way to the edge of the screen, including in the overscan area. And cropping these, you're actually losing some of the image that you want to be keeping. So for these games, you need to make sure that the crop is set to none. But thanks to some amazing updates to DuckStation, the emulator should recognize which games need crop set to none and apply it for you. Amazing. Cropping all borders really isn't actually necessary. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes it can completely mess with the aspect ratio. And as a result, it's dead to me. Now to put scaling into layman's terms, it's kind of like applying a filter to the entire image after everything's gone through the renderer, because scaling is taking place upon output. And which one of these you select, again, comes down to personal preference. Its effects are subtle, but because it is taking place across the entire image, it does change the overall aesthetic. Now the PS1 is pretty infamous for its dithering pattern, and thankfully we've got a couple of different ways to remove it or change how it looks. And first up is true color rendering. This will remove the dithering pattern entirely, but at the cost of some color accuracy. But that is really just a tiny price to pay. Now if you go up to the advanced tab, we've also got true color debanding. When this is active at the same time, it is adding a subtle modern dithering technique back into the game. So if you don't like the PS1 dithering, but you don't want to remove it entirely, go with this. 
Unfortunately, true color rendering does break some effects in a handful of games. But for those, we do have a backup slash alternative, which is this scale dithering option here. It is grayed out at the moment because true color rendering is currently active. So if we deactivate this, you can see that this becomes active. And if you leave this checked, it will simply step in as soon as you deactivate true color rendering. It's not removing the dithering, it's scaling it to your screen resolution, lessening its appearance. Now, if you like dithering patterns, you may prefer this to true color debanding, in which case leave true color rendering off and scale dithering on. For me personally, I want to completely remove the dithering and avoid it as much as possible. So I'll make sure that true color rendering is active, true color debanding is deactive, and that scale dithering is checked. FMV chroma smoothing helps to get rid of that color blockiness during FMV sequences. Don't expect any miracles out of this one, it really only helps just a little bit. Force NTSC timings will apply a 17% overclock to power region games to get them to run at 60 hertz rather than 50. But because it's via overclocking, it's essentially cheating. And if you have the choice between a power region version and a US region version, go with the US one because it natively runs at 60 hertz. And power region exclusives were really meant to be run at 50 hertz. And overclocking these, you're pretty much just guaranteed to break something. It's here if you want to use it, but it's another one that's dead to me. Now PGXP are the options that stop all of that polygon and texture wobbling, and it's got three main different functions. The first of which is geometry correction. This will fix the actual geometry wireframe from Z fighting and wobbling about, which is pretty transformative. When we activate geometry correction, we then get access to all of the PGXP options in the PGXP tab. And the second main function is perspective correct textures. This will fix the textures that sit on top of that geometry wireframe, stopping them from jittering around when you're changing your camera angle or perspective. And the third main function is perspective correct colors. This doesn't apply to all colors, only the vertex colors, like you see here in Alien Resurrection. And again, this is stopping those from jittering around, although it is really difficult to detect vertex colors from doing that in the first place. Of those three main functions, this is the most likely to break stuff. So I recommend leaving it off by default and only turning it on if A, your game actually has vertex colors and B, it doesn't break anything. Culling correction, you definitely wanna leave on by default as it plugs up any holes geometry correction can create. Preserve projection precision adds a bit more oomph to the entire PGXP chain, helping to further stabilize things. It does have a performance impact and whether it helps or not is gonna vary game to game. So turn this on or off at your own discretion. CPU mode and disable on 2D polygons are compatibility options and DuckStation knows exactly which games these are needed for. So leave these off by default and let DuckStation turn them on for those games specifically. Vertex cache I'm gonna skim past because by its own admission generally provides no benefit. Now if we go back to the rendering tab, we've got this PGXP depth buffer option here. This only needs to be activated for a handful of games that have issues with the depth buffer, like Resident Evil and its elbows and a couple of issues in Twisted Metal. Now when you activate this and go back to the PGXP tab, you can then adjust the depth clear threshold amount. In the description below, I'm gonna to try to compile a list of games that need this along with their recommended threshold value. And if you know of any of these yourself, let me know in the comments below. But I fully recommend that you leave the depth buffer off and only turn it on for the games that absolutely need it. Now that we're all done with the rendering tab and the PGXP tab, we're gonna finish off everything else in the advanced tab. Exclusive full screen, the best one to use is generally borderless full screen, and it's the only one you can select from if you're using Vulkan or OpenGL. Screen position, obviously you want that to be in the center, and you can rotate it if you want to. Now disable mailbox presentation will use double buffering instead of triple buffering, which does have a negative impact on your frame pacing. The use case for this one is pretty specific, so I recommend leave it off by default unless you know what you're doing with it. Threaded presentation is for the Vulkan renderer exclusively and you should definitely be leaving it on by default, otherwise you're just leaving performance on the table. Stretch vertically will prioritize stretching vertically over horizontally. This really only comes in handy if you've got an odd proportion monitor. Multi-sampling are your anti-aliasing options. We can go up to times a MSAA and times a SSAA. Of the two, SSAA looks much, much better. MSAA in my opinion does look a little bit woeful. However, SSAA does eat up more performance, so you may be forced into using multi-sample anti-aliasing, but it's not the end of the world. Accurate blending only needs to be used for a handful of games when you're not using true color rendering. And DuckStation, again, should know which games these are and turn it on for you. 
When you're upscaling, you can introduce one pixel wide lines into rasterized stuff. I haven't personally come across this issue, so I can't actually show you what it looks like. But if you do get those for any reason, you've got one of these three different options to choose from. Again, this isn't a preference thing, just select which one is working best and actually gets rid of those lines. Round off scale texture coordinates can fix misaligned textures in some games, but break others. And it's incompatible with texture filtering. Keep it off by default and only turn it on for the games where you feel the textures are misaligned. But keep in mind, it might not work. If you're upscaling and enhancing and you hit the performance barrier and you still want to go a little bit further, you can try activating software renderer readbacks to get some additional headroom. Before I show you shaders, I'm just going to quickly show you where all of the vSync stuff has moved to. This is now in the emulation options under latency control. Now to cover all of these options in depth would take a video about an hour long. So just to keep it as simple as possible, if you've got a normal display, just use vertical sync. If you've got a G-Sync or a FreeSync monitor, use optimal frame pacing instead. And you've also got the option to reduce your input latency if you're using that. Now we can move on to post-processing, which is all of the shader stuff. And using shaders is really, really easy. Make sure that you enable post-processing in the top left-hand corner, then click on this add button. Then just select the shader that you want to use. CRT Royale tends to be a popular one. If you click on it after you've added it to the chain, you then get all of the adjustment options appear underneath. So you can change its appearance to your heart's content. Now the reason this is called a chain is because you can add multiple shaders. So if you like one effect with one shader and a different effect with a different shader, you can have the best of both worlds and stack them. So all you need to do is just add an additional shader. Now keep in mind where these are executed in the chain may change the final outcome. So you can change which order these are executed in with these move buttons. Now when it comes to defaults, this is definitely a personal preference thing. Some people like to have all of these enhancements turned off and then incrementally turn them on to make sure they don't break anything. Others like myself like to have them all on by default and then turn them off or change them on a per game basis as and when it's required. So I keep all of my defaults just so in the knowledge that I'm going to be changing some of this on a per game basis. And if you want to copy me, I'm just going to go through my tabs now. Now that you know what all of these options actually do, you're going to want to know how to change all of this on a per game basis, see all of your changes take place in real time, and monitor your performance as you're doing it. So you want to go over to OSD, which is on-screen display, and activate all of these to effectively monitor your performance. Doing this is easiest from a maximized window. So start your game as usual, then go into windowed mode and maximize it if you need to. Then go into settings in the top left hand corner and click on game properties. Any changes that we make to this will be made for this game specifically. So if you go into the graphics options, you can see they contain all of those graphics options that we've just covered. And any changes that we make to this will take place in real time. Now I do need to mention how these options with checkboxes work. If there is a gray box, it means that it's using your global defaults, whether that be on or off. If there's a tick, it means that it's definitely on for this game. And if it's a black box, it means that it's definitely off for this game. So make sure that you factor that in when you're playing around with these settings. And I fully recommend just have a play around. Go nuts, figure out what you like, and more importantly, what you don't like. There we go, that was another full graphics breakdown for the Duck Station emulator. And if Stensec does decide to change something in a week's time, I'll let you know what that is in the description below. So if you've watched this video and something does look a little bit different, check there and it should tell you what's changed. And if you've got any little tidbits or tips and tricks for this emulator, again, let me know in those comments. If you like these kind of in-depth graphics guides, I've already done this for a bunch of other emulators. PCSX2, PPSSPP, Rosalie's Moopin GUI with Glide64 and Parallel, Lime3DS, Dolphin, and I'm pretty sure I'm missing some others. But I'm going to link all of those in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, slam me a thumbs up. And if you want to keep up to date with all of this, you know what to do. And apart from that, go play some games. Adios.